We're working through uh, questions on our wonderful Day in the Lord broadcast. We'll be doing that for quite some time. So if you have any questions uh, that you'd like us to deal with, biblical questions, theological questions, uh, you can uh, make comment on our YouTube page. Just comment uh, concerning your question, and or you can send an email to us, and we will see if we can, can work that in. It, it, we might be covering that. I've, I've got almost 50 questions that people have sent so far, so, so we might cover your question too. But if we don't, uh, let us know. We'll see what we can do. But um, we're going to look at a, at a second, another question. Last week we looked uh, almost all week and also yesterday at um, angels and demons and uh, what the Bible has to say about that, at least uh, give an overview of some of those things. Today I want to talk about a question someone sent in uh, based upon um, uh, chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, verse 48. And he asked in this particular issue, and I guess I would have been better off had I turned there. But the question is, can we become perfect? Can we become sinless? So uh, Jesus is talking here at the end of Matthew 5. This is the, uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And he's talking about loving your enemies and those types of things. And then he comes to verse 48 and says, Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So based on this verse and maybe a few others, this individual wonders, is it possible for us to become perfect? Uh, sinless in this life? And that's a question that I think has been kicked around by Christians for for many, many years. Probably one of the better known supporters of, of a sinless perfection type of life was none other than John Wesley, which is strange in a sense because most of us know John Wesley as that great evangelist in England, brought about the evangelical awakening in England, very similar to the great awakening in America that he and his brother and uh, George Whitfield orchestrated to a large degree. And, of course, the father of the Methodist church and so forth. Uh, we, you may not realize that part of his theology had to do with perfectionism. So here, here is his work. This is a slim work. It's not, not a big work, under a little over 100 pages. Very old book here. The Plain Account of Christian Perfection. So Wesley seemed to believe, although he pulled his punches, I think, at times, that we could become sinless eventually in this life. He never said we could become perfect. Uh, we can still make mistakes. We can still uh, be unwise. But he seemed to believe that we could actually come to the place where we no longer sin, apparently in word, deed, or, or thinking. So this is his polemic on that. And uh, if you want to read it, that's uh, it'd be interesting to read. I don't think uh, that holds up biblically at all. First of all, look at your own life. Uh, you know your struggle with sin, with interior, your inward struggle, as well as your exterior. The only way really that anyone could come up with a view that we're, per we're perfect in, their, in the area of sinlessness would be if we redefine sin. If we redefine sin as not, as not committing the great sins, uh, the, breaking the great Ten Commandments, then we would probably could see ourselves maybe as sinless. But remember, a man tried that with Jesus once. We call him the rich young ruler. Jesus laid out the commandments. The rich ruler said, yeah, I've done all those things since I was a little boy. And Jesus then pinpointed his inward sinfulness of greed. So I don't think that holds up biblically very well at all, or even experientially. But biblically, we can think of so many passages that deal with our inward sin. Maybe just one, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and a Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you do not do the things that you want. So here in Galatians, we see a battle between our fleshly desires as Christians and what the Spirit would want in our lives. He goes on to verses 19 through 21 to outline some of the deeds of the flesh. Uh, moral sins, anger sins, selfish sins, drunkenness, all these kinds of things that are, uh, are things the flesh wants us to do that we battle with. Then he calls for us to, to uh, walk in the Spirit. He says if we do that, then we'll have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. 
Uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit is these types of things, but the deeds of the flesh are the exact opposite. And he pulls no, no punches here, nor does he do that in Romans chapter 7, when he looks at his own life and sees the great battle, the great struggle going on with sin. I don't think there's any place in the scriptures that indicate that we ever are free of these kinds of battles. Until the Lord takes us home or he comes for us, we will battle the world system that's against us. We'll battle the demonic powers that hate us and hate God. And we'll battle mostly our own flesh that desires to sin. So sinless perfection, not taught in scripture.